All right, guys. Totally, totally random periscope. Totally random periscope. But as you can see, I'm carrying a baby around, taking the baby shifts, having a glass, having a glass, you know, a little bit of lily lay. Either it gets dark or until this baby starts screaming. So if you guys got any questions for me, hit me up. What are the questions? What do you guys got? What are some questions? Drop them in the comments right now. Normally, you know, everything's a little bit more pre-planned. And I can talk about some stuff, but just tell me what to talk about. You get to command me right now. You get to command me to answer your questions. So what do you guys want? What do you guys want to know about? It can be anything. Anything at all. What do you guys want to know? You got to drop it. What do you guys want to know? Man, it's such a nice spring day. I'm just absolutely... Look at this. Look at this stuff. Look at these crocuses. I got to get... I got to get myself a yard full of crocuses. All right. Is there anything higher than 5D? Well, yes, there is. Yes, there is. There is something... There is dimensions higher than 5D or densities. Um, this is going to be a little bit complicated to explain... In fact, I don't really know that I can really explain it super well because here's one of the things, guys. And actually, this is even true for 5D for a lot of people. But uh, our genetic structure does not allow us, our genetic structure at the moment does not allow us to really perceive these higher levels of consciousness. It's just not possible. It's not possible. So... You know, and there's a lot of people right now who don't even understand. They don't understand 4D even. And then there's people who don't understand 5D. Now, they have more examples of these things, so at least they can see avatars of it. But when you go into higher and higher densities, things really change from what I understand about it. So a great example of something that might change is um, from what I understand... Okay, here, here's, a, here's, a really good, here's a really good segue with this, a really good way to transition this. So when you look at things like, uh, how do I put this? So we look at 5D and we see all this you know, very love, joy, consciousness, and we talk about energy. We talk about energy and we talk about how certain events can manifest themselves. We talk about the energy ceiling and how it falls down into like onto the densities like this and manifests into some sort of physical reality. 6D is going to be more of like a, um, a pre-matter fabric, right? So you could say that 5D is... This is my conception of it. I could be wrong. But my conception of it, 5D as a consciousness is is about as much as the physical bodies that we can even at least that we have right now at least can stand but as high as it can stand and that 60 i've i've heard it understood as sort of like a fractal type um has not yet been manifested it's been manifested here the, the love gets more and more intense and I, I have to be honest i'm not physically able to conceive of it i have to sort of you know, I've heard people who, who claim to be connected to like old Lemuria, et cetera. They'll talk about how they'll talk about these different densities, but I don't know that we have the DNA activation yet to really be able to perceive them. But I'm not even sure to what extent. Because, you know, also when you talk about these like density systems or dimensions, what we there, there's like the physical representation of it. What does that look like? How does it look in the physical realm? How does it express itself? And then there's like, how does it look on almost a mathematical level? And when I've heard of 6D, I've heard it described as like geometric forms and stuff that have not yet been um, put together, basically. But some people maybe will describe it as just a higher and higher state of love, but I don't think there's a calibration aspect to it. It may not really necessarily know a boundary whatsoever, whereas 5D clearly understands boundaries. 5D is emotionally connected. 
upper 5D in particular is very, very much connected to everybody and understands everybody and their own different choices. But I don't think that you could say that they would feel, they would still feel like they're separate individuals from others. So there's a increasing lack of individuality, but, um, or, or yeah, I think a better way to put it is an increasing sense of unity. It's a better way to put it. But, um, you know, when people talk about archangels and stuff like that, those are much higher density beings. And I've heard the density system um, described as seven layers, the lowest. And I've heard described at things like 11 or 12 layers, 12 or 13 even. Some people, I mean, it, it's very tough to tell. I, I think it's just beyond our conception. So let's see what's, not, what's here. Anima animus. Okay. So anima animus would be the conscious unconscious dynamic hey. between, yeah, conscious unconscious dynamic between generally a man and a woman. Um, there's a couple different ways you can look at it from a Jungian perspective. The conscious aspect of it, like if you were an ENTP, your anima, your anima, if you're a male ENTP, your anima, I'm going to have to bounce a little bit here. I hope you guys don't mind. Don't get motion sickness. Just don't watch if it's giving you a problem. Um, if you're a, like, for instance, a male ENTP, your anima would be a female ISFJ. And I think that most people in life have, have had an anima, if you're a man, or animus, if you're a woman, relationship. Because it's basically a relationship that brings out a bit of the unconscious mind. Subconscious maybe is a more technical term for it. But this is the part that, you know, this is, this is in many ways what you would aspire to be like. Certain elements of yourself that you would love to express, but are not really expressed. So um, if you go into sort of like typology, Jungian stuff, they have different ways to kind of talk about how you want to become your anima or animus. Um, I, I have, I'm not really so sure about that, but I do think that there's an inclination for the mind to compensate itself with the anima or animus. And so what you, and so, and so what you basically, what you basically do, what, what basically happens when you're in an anima or animus relationship is you have an extremely strong connection, extremely strong connection and extremely exhausting connection, extremely exhausting. Those relationships will burn you out. High passion, very, very deep. And then you're just completely, you're completely exhausted afterwards. So very high growth, but they're not usually sustainable relationships. Um, they're, they're often very toxic, to be honest, or depends how you define toxic, but high levels of stress, let's put it that way. So, um, is bringing awareness to pockets of shame a good enough start to deep work? What does getting to the end result look like? Shamelessness, right? I think that um, it's, a, it's a good start to deep work, but eventually... So look, there's different ways to look at this. There's different ways to deal with growth. And I think that the reality is that if you really understand how people operate, you know that they're only going to, people are only going to even resonate with certain types of growth. Okay? This is important. This is actually really important stuff. I don't begrudge other coaches and the kind of things that they do with clients because we're all reaching different people for different reasons. So some people are going to be very drawn to me because, um, how do I put it? Well, because they, they are drawn to my resonance and also maybe other things about me, my personality. So there's the personality element, but a lot of it is really the level as well. The level. And so when we have these sort of situations here, like there are some people who are going to talk and very much, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to act this way, you need to act that way. And for where they are at, that's what they need to hear. They'll listen to me, and they'll think, the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> this guy doesn't make any sense. This guy's too woo-woo. And then there's actually other people who will say that I'm not woo-woo enough, maybe. The point here 
is that I want to get that out of the way. I want to get that out of the way. Because I'm finding more and more that in my work that the answers are getting simpler. Doesn't mean they're getting easier, but they're getting simpler. It's less and less do this, do this, do this. It's more like really asking certain questions and making certain shifts. And because of my own field and my development of my own field, and of course the development of the macro field, which has nothing to do with me directly, has to do with the planet and the cycle. Those sort of deeper questions are making a lot more sense. And it's not really so relevant as much anymore about, oh, well, I have to say this thing, I have to do this thing, like it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So is bringing awareness to pockets of shame good enough to start deep work? Totally. But the reality is that what, like, once you start to bring that awareness, if you're really bringing the awareness, it's going to start to come out. It's going to start to come out and you're going to start to see that there are relationships all over the place in your life that you are in only because of shame or at least the nature of the relationships. You're only in because of guilt and shame, because of various control factors. Um, doesn't mean you don't love those people, but what it means is that maybe you want to do a bit more. Maybe you want a bit more. This baby's pulling my headphones out of my... Stop this, baby! Look at this baby right here. She's grabbing it. Stop. Stop. Let it go. All right. Got it back. I got it back. Stole it back from the baby. So that's going to be really difficult for a lot of people to renegotiate these sort of relationships because a lot of relationships are based on trauma bonding. Even like overall, like not like terrible relationships have levels of trauma bonding in them. And so, or generational karma bonding, which is trauma bonding. So it's going to be difficult shift for people. Difficult shift. All right. Do you think the digital age will pass soon? I wonder if the end of the age will be our way into 5D. All right. Nothing wrong with technology. Nothing at all wrong with technology. Um, the problem is what we do with technology right now. And so we have these sort of dual agendas of transhumanism on one hand. Um, actually, even transhumanism, you might say is sort of like a middle path <laughs> because transhumanism at least is sort of an, an elevation of the individual with technology whereas a lot of the stuff we're going we're being exposed to is really more just complete technological slavery but the other path is really this hey we are we're getting grounded back into our energetic fields we're activating dna we're doing things through a natural biological process, we're just simply evolving as individuals. Or maybe a better way to put it is going back to what we were initially. So, okay. So I don't think that technology disappears after this stuff. I mean, it's just that the nature of the technology and what the technology is designed to facilitate changes. And I think a good way to look at it is really, I, I mean, there's other ways you can look at this too, but look at like magic and like, look at like the elves, okay? The elves versus maybe the orcs. And so the elves did, they like, built things, but there was an elegance and a beauty to them. And moreover, what they, what they did with these various tools and various weapons and, and whatnot, um, there was like a magic to them. They were harnessing the energy of the individual. Whereas generally, you know, you look at like, like the orcs and stuff represent a lot of like heavy machinery and stuff like that. Um, it was very much about, it was very material. It's like material versus energetic. If your energetic state is right, you can use technology. If the technology is not designed to hijack, technology is simply can be an amp amplification of your energetic field. It can be an amplification of what is good. It doesn't have to. So technology is not bad. So I don't think we're going to see the end of the digital age. I mean, a great example of this is what are we doing right now? We're connecting, and without the internet, we would not have a broader consciousness. We would not have a broader consciousness, baby. And that's one of the big things. So, baby. Doesn't quite understand. Let me see the baby. 
She's going to get upset. She's going to get mad. Baby's going to get mad. We wouldn't have this level of consciousness that we have today without the internet. One of those things that internet can be a control mechanism, a hive mind, and it can also be a place where individual minds can connect and can meet across bounds. So I don't think that digital age technology is a bad thing, but the way that technology is designed definitely is right now. The way it's designed, the way that it caters to really low-level stuff. But the biggest problem is really our own consciousness. Because if our consciousness was really different, we wouldn't even care about this stuff. We would want to get out into nature. We would want to be... Like, look, like I'm going to tell you, I'm doing this right now in part because this is the first day. I could have done it yesterday, too. But this is like the first or second day of the year. that I, I, like, This is the first day of the year that I have been out barefoot in the grass. I miss it so much. I feel like it's a little cold, but it's good. It's amazing. It feels great. So it's, we got to get back to nature more. And I think we're going to see that divide expand a lot more pretty soon. Okay. Can you comment on how peak NTP this periscope is, carrying baby AMA? Look, man. <laughs> Trying to get the mind less busy, to be honest. But if I'm not feeling like... <laughs> I figured it was like, kill two birds with one stone, right? You can do a couple things at the same time, why not? What do I make of uh, Jordan B. Peterson's silence on COVID current situation? Okay. Given how outspoken he's been on authoritarian government, etc. All right, here's the, here's the deal with Jordan Peterson. I've talked about this before. I'm not, I'm not of the mind to, I'm not of the mind to attack this guy. Okay. I like Jordan Peterson. I, I like, I, I think, I think that we have to be really honest with ourselves about just how much he's done for, for the world, especially men. How many, how much, how much, seriously, how much have we grown as a resort of, as a result of Jordan Peterson? And unlike other people like Cernovich, he hasn't become like a rat. So it's not like we have some reason to be mean to Jordan Peterson, okay? I have all sorts of thoughts on what's happened to Jordan Peterson and would I like him to really be the tip of the spear a little bit more and talk a little bit more expansively about certain topics, like what is going on right now with censorship. I think I have to be fair to the man and see he's pretty broken right now. And why he's broken is a very interesting question. How that happened to him, very interesting question. But guys, I got to be honest, I think that he was very, very seriously threatened. I think he was uh, made some offers that were very difficult to refuse. And I think in some ways, his, his self-destruction was a way of gain out of the responsibility of having to make these choices. So I really want to be kind to Jordan Peterson because you just don't know. You have no idea what people at that level. He single-handedly, he was the biggest influence on male psychology. Like if you go from 2016, it was Trump. And then this, the second biggest influence on male psychology in the first two years of Trump's presidency was Jordan Peterson. And you guys... I mean, maybe you do, but a lot of people have no idea just how expansive his influence has been. People who don't even like Trump changed, shifted things because of Jordan Peterson. So he was a big target. And frankly, I mean, you look what they did to his daughter. <laughs> um, but frankly... I have a lot of respect for him. I don't want to put, I don't want to say, why didn't he do this? I think he's done enough. He's done more than enough. You know, he's, he's somebody, if you look at the field of battle in this kind of stuff, he's somebody who got like blown the fuck up. He got blown the fuck up. And people are like, why can't you get back out there in the regiment? I mean, let's let this guy retire with honor. It's my perspective. Well, let me see here. I think this baby, well, maybe I can get another question. Maybe I can get another question. My, my wife's doing yoga outside, so let's see. 
Let's see. You guys got another question? You guys got another question? One more question, maybe? How do psych psychedelic substances or meditation practices interact with dimensional experience? Okay. So psychedelics are, are, uh, are a drug. I mean, they're bad. Depends on how you use them. So a lot of people, I've never used psychedelics, by the way, never used it. I think the closest you can claim to me using it was I had some, some shake when I was in Jamaica on spring break in college that was claimed to have mushrooms in it, but I didn't really experience much. So I've never, ha I've never done psychedelics, <laughs> never done psychedelics. Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with psychedelics. I know a lot of people who have benefited from it. I've actually felt open to doing it, but every time I've opened myself up to doing it, circumstances haven't aligned and I trust that. It opens up your energetic field. Now, here's the problem. If it opens it up to a lot of things, <laughs> not um, let me let me mention something very interesting for you guys, perhaps. No, I'm, it's gonna be interesting, baby. It's all right. It's gonna be interesting. One of the reasons that Christianity and other monotheistic religions, despite what um, maybe we think about them in some sense in different, uh, you know, new age-ish communities. One of the reasons that they did better and they won out was because, was not because what the pagan religions believed in was not true. It's actually not correct. What the pagan religions, to certain extents, did believe in things that were perhaps true. Now, of course, you had with the ancients, like we had like Romans and Greeks, they were believing in um, much more believing in, in uh, aliens, in alien gods, people who acted like gods. But let's, let's say, but there were also things with fairies and druids and um, with, with various, you know, leprechauns, various entities that these were things that existed. They exist in the astral realm. And until our pineal glands were shut down, people could see these. And people can still see them. There's plenty of people who still have experience with these entities. But a lot of them have been blocked out. But they're astral beings. And so what would happen is that you'd have these different groups were aware of these astral beings. And they honored them. They made deals with them. And the reality is that some are benevolent. Talk to Goldman about this. Goldman is very experienced in the dichotomy between an astral entity that will help you and God's source energy. Very different things. And so the problem with a lot of these pagan religions is that they were worshiping astral entities, which are not God's source. They maybe are a different dimension or density above us, but they are not. Oh, look, I think she went down. I think she went down. But they're not that high up. And you have to make deals with them, and they might help you, but... So, the, so I think it's important to understand the nuance here that they're not necessarily bad. There are demons and demons are evil, but they're not all, all bad. There's a lot of ones that are very neutral. They want certain things and they'll give you certain things in return. And it's not that they have a negative agenda. They just want what they want. And a lot of pagan religions worship this, but the power of higher source energy very much transcended all that stuff. And so you were you had disciples and whatnot were able to do things that Yeah, fairies with fairies were big with deal making in Irish culture. Yeah, fairies like and if you didn't fulfill your end of the bargain, they'd go after you. But it was very different to tap into the source energy. So this is what happens when people go to psychedelics, they see the astral. And astral entities will very often tell them things. Sometimes it's just a fun ride. I mean, you look at the Cortez. Cortez, Cortez did uh, 
ayahuasca and just, you know, he just had a fun time. He just seen all sorts of crazy shit, had a fun time, no big deal. Sometimes, though, these entities will really go after you one way or another. But you're not going to get to God's source through this stuff. You're kind of like playing a game. And that's why people like, again, to reference Cernovich, who's now going to be doing this stuff like full time. Cernovich is clearly hijacked by that kind of stuff. He's clearly like an astral entity hijacked individual. And I think people, a lot of people can see that pretty clearly at this point. Again, it's not a hate on ayahuasca stuff. I think in context, it can be very healing. And it does open up your energetic system. But as, as you just said, Jackson, beware of unearned wisdom. You don't want to, you, you don't want to do that stuff. You don't, you don't want to lean too heavily on things that you haven't done the work for. I can tell you, I've talked about things. I talked about some stuff. People are like, oh, have you done shrooms? Have you done psychedelics? No, I haven't done any. You can access this stuff on your own. You don't, it's more work, but you don't need to go through all these hackings and, and hijacks. And I actually don't know how well I would feel doing psychedelics because from what I understand, if you're already pretty activated, they can maybe hurt. They can maybe make you sick because you're kind of overloaded. So there's a lot of context and nuance with this. Not anti them. I would love to see more of them happening. I would love to see more people using them. But I would love to see more wisdom in the usage of them because you are legitimately asking astral entities to enter your life and you don't know what their agenda is. You just don't know. It could be a good agenda. You know, I've heard people who have had a lot of experience with psychedelics when they stopped using them. It was almost like they had to say goodbye to friends because there were entities in the astral that would work with them, but they weren't higher source energy. And so they had to break contracts with those entities. It's very complicated. They are, they are always around us and we don't notice them. Well, some notice them. I can tell you on my hike in the woods, you could feel them in certain forests. Even if you couldn't see them, you could feel them. You could feel that certain woods have a different energy, that there's a different feeling. The woods that were always around populations were like domesticated. But when you got deeper out in the mountain ranges, I'm actually getting energetics like right now talking about this. You go into certain woods and you're like, let me pass. You almost want to say, let me pass. I don't mean any harm. Let me pass. Like they're watching you as you go through there. And, and anybody who, I mean, if you don't feel that when you go off into a deep woods, you haven't gone to a deep enough woods or you just are completely shut down. I mean, they, they really, you have to really make your intention clear to them that you come in peace, that you respect them. And if you see certain things, no one to back off. You have to treat it almost like you're dealing with an animal out there because, yep. They have malevolent feelings. Yeah, some have malevolent feelings. And you really have to be careful. If the woods is in a bad mood and some woods have some very dark energy to them, um, I wouldn't say that I experienced what I would call like really dark energy, but it was dark. It wasn't so much of like evil. It was just, uh, it wasn't welcoming. Let's put it that way. It wasn't welcoming. Yep. Old forest and fellowship of the rings. Yep. Okay. Do you think different parts of the world are better for us spiritually? Well, <laughs> we can talk about some fun stuff here. So first thing let's talk about. Let's, first thing let's talk about. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. And the reason for that is there's two reasons for that. First is that some areas have been legitimately blessed. Okay. Some places have been blessed 
there's been a lot of healing work done at these locations. And so when you go to those locations, you're going to get lots of positive source energy. Święta Lipka in Poland is, I actually think Święta Lipka, I haven't been to Czestochowa, so I, I can't personally comment, but from what I've understood, Czestochowa is like considered the most holy place in Poland. But I've heard some dark energy come out of it. I don't know if there's a hijacking or something. I'm not sure. Polish people can comment on their own experience. I haven't been. But there's a small town in northeastern Poland called Święta Lipka. It's pretty much based around a church. And it's a beautiful church. I got to tell you, I haven't experienced high energy like that since places in Rome. Since like the holy stairs in Rome. Super holy place. Super holy place. Um, I actually had a miracle. I, I'm going to tell you guys something crazy, all right? Crazy, hilarious, very minor story. I lost my wallet. I lost my wallet before Święta Lipka. I don't know what... The, the place that we were at the night before, we couldn't find it. We were late. We were delayed like over an hour. Looking everywhere for the wallet, it was gone. Okay, it was gone. I'm going to tell you something that's crazy. It is crazy. We left Święta Lipka. I said a prayer, kind of jokingly, to be honest, about the wallet. Because... It's inconvenient, but it wasn't the end of the world. Um, and when we were leaving Święta Lipka, and we were in the car, my wife puts her hand in the bag of chips and looks at me, and she looks at me like, like freaking out. Like, what's going on here? Was there like some present inside the bag of chips? Because that's the way it was. And she pulled my wallet out of the bag of chips. I'm, I'm, not fucking, I'm, like, I'm not fucking with you guys. She pulled my wallet out of the bag of chips. It was absolutely bizarre. It was bizarre. Now, I'm not going to go, like, for the materialists out there, the bag of chips was opened. But it was also rolled up, and how would my wallet find its way into it? Like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but, but that's what happened. And so these are various... <laughs> Chantalipa was great. So there are places that because of various rituals and holy stuff that's been done that create a very positive energetic field. There's another place too, another kind of place too. Another place. I gotta get, I'm going to get some... I'm going to get some... Uh, some wine. We got an open bottle of, I believe, some Austrian Gruner Veltliner. Can I try this out? I guess I'm going to go on a little tour here. Let's see here. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to answer some more questions because the baby's asleep now. So we're good until the sun really gets. We got down here. You guys can keep posting some questions, and I will get to them. Oh, you guys see the Bengal cat here. Ben's always about this cat. He loves this cat. That's my alarm cat. Wake up every morning. If I don't get up, if I don't get up by 6 a.m., this cat will wake me up. And very often, he's, he's waking me up at 5.30, which is great. Get a lot more done. All right. So the other part of the spirituality question in the different places. We have these things, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're called ley lines. You guys familiar with ley lines? So I made a, I made a little joke the other day. I'm switching, switching hands. I made a joke the other day about Mount, Mount Shasta, right? Mount Shasta making fun of some of these spiritual people. But to be fair to them, Mount Shasta is widely considered to be a ley line. And a ley line... Well, actually, it's actually more than a ley line. Ley lines are lines that cross the planet. Call them energetic lines that run across the current of the planet, like veins. Because the planet's a living being, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why ascension's happening. Because it's not about us. It's about the planet. <laughs> the planet is ascending. Gaia is a living organism. And some of us, 
are immunophages, and some of us are parasites. It's the way to look at it. Some of us are immunophages, some of us are parasites. But Gaia is evolving. She's evolving, and she doesn't care what you want. <laughs> she doesn't care. She's moving up. She's done with it. She's done with being taken advantage of. And these ley lines are her veins, right? Oil, etc. I remember arguing with my professor in college that it didn't make any sense that there would be peak oil. Oil is renewable. In a certain sense, it's renewable. And really, it, it, that's, a very, that's a very interesting topic if you want to talk about it. But oil is um, it's like, it's like the blood of the planet, basically. And there's nothing wrong with using some of it, but obviously harvesting it to a strong degree gets to a... We don't need it. We don't really need it, to be honest. But she's getting tired of the exploitation of the planet. She's getting tired of her own exploitation. So ley lines, though, are these energetic veins that run through the planet. All right, I'm going to mention a ley line in a second. A place where there's an intersection of ley lines. Can you guys name one? There's a couple of them. Name an intersection of some ley lines down below. Name them. Name them down below. What are some What are some intersections of ley lines? Ojai, I actually don't know that. Pyramids are a big one. I don't think I don't think New York City is one. I'm not. Sure. I don't think New York City is one. I'm not sure about that. Could be. A lot of cities are on ley lines. Pyramids are definitely one. Stonehenge, definitely one. Here's a really fun one. Here's a really fun one. Disney World. Disney World. That's a great one. Right on the ley line. Massive harvesting point. Massive harvesting point. Yeah, Rome. I mean, there's a ton of them. It's actually crazy. When you look at the ley line structure and you see how many cities line up for it, it's pretty insane. Yeah, Disney World's a massive hijacking. <laughs> and they knew that. They put it right on some ley lines so that they could harvest people's energy, get everybody to feel a certain way, and then harvest it. I've heard that there's some serious tunnels under Disney World where they do all sorts of stuff. They harvest energy directly down there. I mean... I don't know about that, but, but the facts about the CIA purchasing that land back in the 50s and having it completely, you know, have, having it all bought, right? Um, I don't have it on me, but, but yeah, you can find one for sure. So ley lines are important. And then you also have what some people have called the various chakras of the earth and I'm not, I don't really understand this necessarily. I'm not saying it's not true. But I'm, the maps I've seen of it seem like they are... Uh, the maps I've seen of, of these sort of chakra centers for the planet are a little bit... You know, they're trying to say there's nine chakras and just like there's... Um, or seven chakras, whatever. I don't know. It, it, it's kind of... I don't know where they're getting it from. Let's put it that way. I don't know where, I'm not saying it's wrong. I just don't know where they're getting it from. But Mount Shasta is one of these holy places. So it was Mount Uluru, um, Glastonbury. Glastonbury has serious energy in the UK, from what I understand, which is why they have their festival there in Glastonbury. Once you guys understand it, it makes a lot more sense. Once you understand how this stuff works, it makes so much more sense. But places, all these, all these various places on the earth that seem super holy. Mount Titicaca. Lake Titicaca, rather. Isla del Sol. You know, I broke up with my girlfriend on Isla del Sol. I have so much. <laughs> you talk about intense energies. Isla del Sol in the middle of Lake Titicaca. Absolutely incredible. Probably like three, three places you can stay at on the entire island. So there's a lot of 
interesting stuff on this planet when it comes to energetic structures. But yeah, guys, I think that's, uh, you guys get the idea. Different parts of the world are better for us spiritually. You can create your own little protected areas. I can tell you one thing that this house, you see this? This property is very, very much protected. We have stuff buried all over the place on this property. We have, we have, we have items buried all over the place. We have crosses facing each other in the right directions. We have everything blessed. I'm a protected field. And I recommend you protect your own place. And if your place doesn't feel protected, to get rid of that stuff. We'll do Stargates next time. Much love to all of you. I appreciate it. Look at this. Look how well it worked out. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. I'll see ya.